Well, uh, Shelby, are we ready to turn it over to Troy? Yes, we are. I gave him presenter. I can see the slides are up and running. So I think we're ready to go. All right. With that, sir, you have the stage. I'm looking forward to listening. All right. Thanks, guys. So um, first of all, thanks for having me here. Thanks for th for joining the, the, the webinar and being part of this discussion here about blue team stuff. I'm here to talk about maintaining operational readiness in a SOC. And, and what does all that mean? And really just focusing on those, those prep, uh, preparational steps that we take before things catch on fire, before things go, go bad. I actually went with this, this, this depiction here of these uh, little guys I used to like back in uh, being an 80s kid, early 90s. I don't know if anybody recognizes who these, who these folks are, but these are the doozers from Fraggle Rock. I always felt kind of bad for them. And, and looking back at like my experience of working in a SOC and working in, as an InfoSec analyst, that it basically overworked and underappreciated. And that's what these little guys were. Like they were always constantly working and then the Fraggles from Fraggle Rock would come and destroy everything that they, they did. And they would just, you know, keep, you know, putting everything back together. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's who those guys are. And we're going to talk about what we can do to take our SOC to the next level and uh, be prepared for the inevitable. So a little bit about myself prior to, I, I actually worked today at Black Hills and French Security. Prior to starting there, um, I go, started back in InfoSec about 2006, um, getting out of the military. I got it, landed an internship. Still, still in school, kind of didn't really know what I was going to do, wanted to do, um, kind of like pretty much everybody, I guess, in college. And uh, I, I landed a gig and was able to like get, get my feet wet doing intrusion detection. So if, if you listen to at the very beginning before we jumped into this, it was really like sitting in front of a screen, seeing, you know, bad thing happen. You click on, okay, now I need to investigate. And you have like one packet that says this bad thing happened. And the, it was a struggle, right? And so if you've ever opened up a PCAP in Wireshark and stared at the data and was like, I don't understand what's in front of me, I've been there, right? I know the feeling. It, it gets better over time. If you're just starting out, don't worry. You know, persistence is key. But, but essentially, I was able to then, you know, build upon all that and, and then, you know, you know work towards doing uh, additional things had the opportunity um, to start on an organization where we didn't have a SOC and we build it from the ground up. So understanding the learning pains there, essentially being part of, you know, maintaining the security infrastructure as well as having to like respond to alerts. So you're keeping all these things up and running and then all of a sudden, you know, alert fires and you have to drop that and then go work the alert and come back. So so those, those are the struggles that I experienced over those, over those years. But then, you know, going on through my career, you know, and getting more mature into incident response, I uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, be a SOC manager for uh, temporarily until they filled the role. But I, but I am a, a, like to stay in the technical weeds. So, um, so that really wasn't something I, I, I enjoyed from one perspective, but also I did learn from a lot, right? So how, how you manage the components and, and, and things are, are very important. So, but today, you know, at Black Hills and Fringe Security, you know, I do uh, a plethora of different things. A security analyst is my title, uh, but I've been involved in some pen test engagements, um, also some hunting engagements, and a little bit of incident response as well. And for those of you that don't know, Black Hills is actually standing up a, uh, a, a managed SOC, an active SOC. And, and being involved a little bit in that as well. All right, so we're going to talk about what can we do when it comes to being prepared for, for the inevitable. There's common things that, that we take care of, we're used to uh, ironing out, and I'm going to address some of that. But then I'm also going to get into a little bit of some, how do you take it to the next level, right? What's the next gen things that you can do to make sure that we're always prepared? There's never too much, you're never too prepared. We, we know that. So but what are some of the things that we can do? And really, the focus is going to be on the, the people, process, and technology around to the SOC because that's what makes up the SOC. When I was putting together this presentation, I was thinking to myself, okay, operational readiness, it sounds really cool. 
what I got from it was the, the terminology from the, the Defense Department. Their mission is to keep our country safe. And our mission as InfoSec analysts, as SOC analysts, is to keep our organization, our, our entities who's employing us, you know, keep those assets uh, safe and secure, whatever, however we measure that safe and secure, that's, that's ultimately what our job is. And there's, there's no other litmus test for being ready than actually the United States military, in my opinion. So I, I found this quote interesting and, and, and something that I wanted to, um, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but essentially these requirements here ensure that the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines receive the necessary training and well-maintained equipment. And, and for them, it's, you know, training is key for us. Training is key. Equipment, what does that mean, right? The weaponry and all the other logistics that goes around with making sure the mission is successful. And so that's really what I wanted to focus on in this talk, but not ultimately forget the, the number one, you know, takeaway is that the people are what make it, what we can make it matter. Hopefully, I don't have to convince anybody that uh, being prepared is important. We've all heard, if you haven't been here, about to hear it. That saying that it's a not a matter of if, but when. So if that's the case, then what is your SOC doing to prepare for that inevitable incident? Right? What are we doing? What are we What are we doing to maintain that 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 we're 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 staying sharp, skill set wise, that alert wise, that we're uh, we're prepared uh, across all those facets. But then also, you, you know, we have to also think about. There's this concept that that we've been doing for several years now, assuming that we're always breached or compromised, right? So we do things like go threat hunting and look for things that may have gotten past our defenses. Um, no alerts fire doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're clear. And as InfoSec analysts that have been in this, the, this work for a long time, we realize that we can't just assume that everything is copacetic, that, that something, we're missing something, right? So that's the concept of going hunting and looking for the things that have gotten missed. The IR life cycle. I like both of these models, the two different models. One is from NIST um, on the left. And then on, on the right, we have the, the, the SANS model, the Pickerel model. Both of these models uh, I like a lot for different reasons. But essentially, that we're at the bookends, right? Of what this discussion is at the bookends. We're not going to talk about how we, how we identify all the bad things and how we do containment, eradication, recovery, or forensics or anything like that in this talk, right? Those are important things. But this, this talk is about the, the, the well-oiled machine that is called your SOC, right? And so, and making sure that that well-oiled machine is ready to go and, and do all the things it needs to do. So I, I like the Pickerel model because it, it really breaks things down into phases in which I, I, I line to very well. I, I kind of uh, relate to very well. It kind of like, if you look at the NIST model where you have containment, eradication, recovery, I look at those as, as separate kind of phases. So I, I, I kind of cringe sometimes when it's all lumped in there. But, but it makes sense from, from, from some, some angles, and I get that. It, but I, what I really like about the, the NIST model, though, is that feedback loop. And, and I know it's there with the Pickerel model. Don't get me wrong. But I like this depiction where everything's kind of a, a, a cycle, right? This is not a waterfall type approach, right? Incident response is not a waterfall approach to how we solve these problems. We were constantly going back and 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 saying, okay, we're in the middle of said thing. We stopped something. Did we did we stop all? Did we detect all of it? Right. Um, we think we did, but we got to make sure that we're going back. And then, honestly, you know, when you're when you're when you're going through the rest of those phases and you're done, uh, you're you're learning from what happened. Right. What went right? What went wrong? do more of the good things that went right and you do less of the things that went wrong and you're feeding that back into to, to the, the initial prepara preparational phases, right? So I, I like that, how it's modeled that way. And, and really that's where we start from, right? Our starting block is, is that all these different things, right? Do we have the, not the right amount, amount of people? Are our policies up to date, procedures, our IR plan, those kinds of things. So those are important. I'm not saying that they're not. We essentially have to, you know, start somewhere. So I'm not going to dismiss any of that here. Obviously, we're just we're going to build upon it. And like I said, you know, previously going into this, that is that a, a SOC is really a compilation of 
people, process, and technology. And I, I know it sounds a little cliche, but as that that is what makes up a, a, a security operations center. And I want to emphasize that the people aspect is uh, number one, right? In that order, the people, process, technology. It's not just a saying for me. It, it's it's really people first the process second, and then technology comes last. We, we may hear things, you may, depending on how long you've been in the industry, you may hear, you know, a suit walk into the room say, we need, you know, this technology, this is the only tech, this is the technology we need, it's going to solve all problems. You're, 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 you're tackling the, the, the issue from the wrong uh, angle, right? Or from the wrong end of this, of this spectrum, right? You, you want the people in place and you, you want to build that environment in which the people are excited to come to work, they're excited to share and collaborate and they're excited about what they do and they're passionate about what they do. And then you build, okay, all the, all the processes around that, that help you function. And it's, it's a, it's a living, breathing, you know, approach there, but process technology comes last. Technology is always changing. If you're relying on technology today for what it is solving the problem, you're going to hear from RSA conference next month that there's a new technology or a new buzzword that everybody needs to be talking about. Right. So it's, you know, staying up on that is is the is the wrong approach, in my opinion. And, and as I mentioned, going into that people aspect, the, the analysts are we are the, the that first step to building a good SOC. This is I'm not getting into like you know I'm in, in HR trying to make you feel good about it. Everything Tr- training is is important. Training is what keeps our 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 not our tools sharp. But a lot of times when you go to training, you got to keep in mind that a lot of that material is good and useful, and knowledge is great. But can you apply it when you go back to work, when you go back to, to, to your organization? You know, how much is, of it is applicable? It's nice to know all these different things and techniques, but how much are you actually able to then implement that, right? So those are some questions you need to be asking yourselves as individuals, as organizations that, that send your analysts to training. When they come back, what did you get from it? If you're in a leadership role, managing a SOC, you know, maybe you want your individual uh, your analyst to come back and, and give a little bit of a, a, a brief talk about what they learned, what they took away from it. What was the good part of the training? What was the bad part? Do we recommend it for additional analysts kind of thing? But then, you know, get more interactive with this stuff, right? The more we do, the, the, the better. Uh, I don't know how many times I've gone to a training course and you've gone through a lab and you're like, well, that was great. I want more labs. I want more, more experience. I want more examples of how to do something because I was able to, you know, take this now a reverse engineering class and I walked through the steps and I was able to find all the bad things in that binary. But then I find a different binary that's totally unrelated in, the, you know, in, in my job and the techniques that I just used don't apply a hundred percent. So, so trying to bring that material back and be a little more interactive with it is, is, is better in my opinion. CTFs are a l- l- little bit better. It takes, takes it to the next level, but then that active stock engagement, right? Like you, you're, you're working with your analysts, you're, you're talking about this stuff, use your real data. There's data in your networks. There's data that you're, you're there. They may be events or events of interest that you guys work that maybe didn't become a, a major incident, work those and work those with the other teams and engage uh, the, the folks in, in your stock. And hiring talent. Sorry, I took so long to actually to, to cross that part out. No offense to those that are highly skilled, but that's not what we need in this industry. We don't need all the people that can solve all the problems day one. We don't need the ones in the room that know all the answers because nobody knows all the answers. And but but what we do need, we need passion and motivated problem solvers, right? So in my experience, when we were looking at candidates coming into a SOC. Or, 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 or to that side sock type role. And it's not, this isn't just per, per security operations centers. This could be anything in the IT field um, or technology for that matter. If you're coming in as a junior, as, a, as an analyst, entry level analyst, or what, what have you, you're not going to know how to do all of it. You're not going to know how to rip apart a PCAP. Maybe you do, and that's great. But I, I would rather have somebody that comes in and we throw problems at them and you just have out of the, uh, be able to solve those problems in, in unique and creative ways. Right, that's what we need. We need people that are in, in motivated and passionate to to do what they do. It, burnout is real, and if you're just coming in day in and day out, and you're putting out fires, and that's all you're doing, excuse me, that's all you're doing. 
you're going to, you're going to lose good analysts. And so, you know, you got to be cognizant of that, especially if you're in a management role or a leadership role that you want to make sure that you're not burning out your, your, your analysts. And, you know, I heard this quote from somebody a long time ago. I don't know the exact wording. So it's, it's, it's kind of paraphrases, paraphrasing, but this is really for, from an economic perspective or those that, that, that are the, that, that, that deal with like the, the dollars and, and cents to, to what uh, funds the stock or, or any entity. But the people, people are your only resource that over time does not appreci- de- depreciate, right? We've all heard that as soon as you drive that brand new fancy $60,000, whatever vehicle off the lot, it depreciates its, its value, right? All the security tools we buy, everything we, we invest in depreciates over time. The one thing in your sock that should not be depreciating is you as the analyst. Right, you're getting better. Right, a 10 year season analyst is worth a lot more than a entry level coming out of college, and that is because you're getting better. Your 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 skill sets, your knowledge, you're being what you're you're more wise because you have all the different experience. Right, that is the only resource that that should not be depreciating over time. And when it comes to fighting fires, that's what we we kind of analogize to. Right, we say that you know we're we're putting out fires and whatnot. So how do you train for that? So training is great, like I, I mentioned earlier, but if you're not training in real life scenarios, if you're not kind of simulating that, that as much as possible, then it's not going to be the same when you're actually in a real fire. A little bit of lessons from being in the military, I was in the Navy. So one thing that every single sailor has in common is you need to learn how to fight fires. And that is because when you're on a ship, there's no place to run and hide from a fire. You either fight the fire and you contain it and you survive that fire, or you're either not surviving or you're abandoning the ship and hopefully surviving that way. But your, your ship, your mission is over if you cannot contain that, that fire. In, in boot camp, I remember you know, going through some of the simulations where the actual flames, you're going in and you're, you're fighting fires where there's actual flames in your face until you can feel that heat on your skin, until that smoke is in the air, it's not going to feel real. And this is how we got to, you know, train at least as, as much as possible. Uh, another, uh, you know, story from my military days is when we would go through one of the, one of the duties I, and responsibilities I had was responsibility for the uh, shipboard security. And uh, one of the schools that we went to was a um, uh, shipboard security engagement weapons system school. And what they did was it was a live fire training. So it was about for small, small arms security of the of the ship and when you go through that class there it's it's all live fire ammunition but you're running through drills you're you're going through obstacles you're in there there's instructors screaming in your face they're purposely jamming your weapon they're putting blanks in there so and you have to get through in a certain amount of time they're trying to simulate as much as possible that adrenaline rush that that the the scenarios in which you know it's it's fight or flight kind of kind of stuff and you know the same could be said about being in a sock you know we could take all this training, we could do all these CTFs, we can do all these things, but until your CISO is in the room screaming down your necks or saying, why, what's going on? How many systems are compromised? You know, has data been ex- exfiltrated? Why do I have this data yet? Whatever it is, right? Those are when times, are, when things are going to change and, and, and pressure is going to be on and decisions, if, you, if they're not, if, if they're done out of, you, you know, a knee, knee jerk type of way and panic, then then that's where our rationality breaks down and we start making forward decisions. We talked about the people part, right? Now, now we kind of move on to, to some of the process. So some kind of low-hanging fruit when we talk about how, how do we make sure we have our process good to go. Uh, you start with an IR plan. If you don't have an IR plan, you know, build one. It doesn't have to be complete, um, but, you, but you have to have something, right? You have to have an, an incident response organization or, or a SOC that's tasked with doing IR, there's actually two parts of an incident response. And I struggled with this earlier on in my days, um, but I kind of realized, okay, this makes sense. You have the actual hands-on tactical, putting out the fires, doing the technical things part, right? That's what we usually refer to as the, the, the annals in the, inside the SOC. But then you have the, the actual communicative part, right? The escalation of, of communications. Um, how is the SOC communicating to the CISO to the CIO, to the CEOs, to those in, 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 you know, maybe in your communications department, if you have a major, major incident that's going to end up on the news, you may want to have those folks involved so they can actually have that, those conversations, right? 
and, and, and making key decisions. Do we disconnect from the internet? All those kinds of things, right? Those are not typically in a, in a general organization, those are not the analysts' call, right? So, so there's a structure there. There's a whole separate part of that incident response that, that's going on. Are those key stakeholders, are, are they there? And that kind of goes into, you know, having those stakeholders. And, and yes, we, we have checklists and tech checklists are great. Checklists help us, you know, automate things. They help us, you know, make sure we don't miss the, the, the low hanging fruit kind of stuff, the, 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 the over and over kind of uh, re, 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 repetitive things. And they also help us kind of communicate, you know, some of the tasks that may have to be done by sysadmins that may not be operation, operating SOC. But speaking of a lot of that, right, does your, everybody that has to take action in your SOC, are they the ones that are all operating the SOC? Most likely they're not. Most likely you have to reach out to a, a sysadmin or somebody else to say, we need you to look into this. We need you to kind of investigate this. So have a good point of contact list and make sure that those point of contacts understand their role. You don't want to be in a situation in which you're in the middle of an incident and you reach out to the person that was assigned to put in some type of uh, preventive type, whether it's a um, somebody signed with a firewall administrative task or you know their, your 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 web proxy or your your endpoint agent, and you say we need this thing shut down, and that person comes back and says, uh, I don't want to shock them outside my job, right? And you're like, okay. And, and maybe it's because that POC list hasn't been updated in, you know, weeks, months, years. Maybe some of those people that are on your POC list aren't even in your organization anymore, right? So make sure that you're keeping that POC list up to date and make sure that, you know, those folks that are actually assigned to those roles understand what their role is. And, you know, know your environment. You know, what's the architecture like? Is it completely flat? Where's the segmentations at? where's all the good stuff, right? Where, where are the things, do you care about every single thing in your environment or are there certain areas which your environment that you want to make sure you put an extra set of eyes on? Maybe that's where you concentrate your sensor you know, capabilities to, you know, and, you know, inventory of things, know what's on your net. And then, you know, what are those ingress and egress points, right? Those choke points. If an external adversary is trying to get into your environment and get data out of your environment, the, the the egress and ingress points are, are going to be where they have to traverse, right? The more an organization has, the, the better it is for availability, perhaps, right? But the harder it is for defending, right? So you got it. There's just more areas that you you have to you have to uh, watch and protect. So know all that stuff, right? Know how data flows in your environment and practice, right? We can't say this enough. Any, any professional athletic team, that's all they're doing when they're, not, when they're not competing. They're not actively, they're practicing nonstop. And there's some things that we can do, right, to do that. Tabletops help us out tremendously. They go through that process part and also bring in the, the, the people. We're kind of leaving the technology out. I mean, some of it might be discussed in the tabletop, but a lot of that technology, we're not gonna, we're just gonna hand wave it either does work or doesn't work depending on the scenario. So, so you, you know, go through those tabletops. Lots of times, those are the times where you, you, you identify those gaps before it may be gaps in your process or in your people before, you know, something happens. And if you need help, you know, Black Hills, you know, we, we offer backdoors and breaches. Just check it out on our website. It's an easy way, a, a game that makes it more fun and interactive to, to do those tabletops. But what you don't want in a tabletop is you don't want stakeholders coming to the table and saying, ah, that's never going to happen. So... You know, when if that does if that does occur and you do have those scenarios, all you have to do is say, well, I don't think, you know, if you look back six months ago, did, would, and, and, and I told you that solar winds was going to be backdoored with legit code sign code and backdoored where an advanced adversary is going to come in and essentially have the keys of the kingdom to whatever they want. They, was anybody thinking about that six months ago? I mean. You know, those are the kinds of things that there's nothing off the table, right? So just just kind of you know you know bring bring real life things to to uh, to, to the table and say that yeah, this has happened and it can happen again. And you know, getting keep keep the engagement going, right? Cyber ranges are great. Cyber ranges keep us you know keep keep the juices flowing and you know helping us you know kind of keep our brains exercised. But we want to exercise our team too. And look at purple team and red team and, and dark teaming. And, and if you don't know what that is, well, purple teaming is kind of like 
essentially you have a red teaming type engagement, but you're working hand in hand with the with the blue teamers, right? So you're not just saying, "Ooh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and attack the network and see how far I can get in." You're 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 essentially working hand in hand and making sure that detection capabilities are there and and that. If you haven't done any of this, you probably should start with a purple team. Then if your team gets really good, move on to a red team. And you know, dark teaming is basically like a step up from red teaming. Essentially red teaming, but there's less people in the organization that know, there's less information given to the team. That's kind of like more of a, a realistic scenario of uh, emulating a, a, an advanced external uh, or internal uh, threat actor. And you know, take your process to the next level, right? So turn your checkbooks into automation stuff, into playbooks. Playbooks help us do the automation stuff. The latest buzzwords and then you know stuff about SOAR, security orchestration automation things. So if you're doing these repetitive tasks during an incident and you're constantly doing those over and over again, turn those to checkbooks in the playbooks. Those are things that you can just press a button and run. You don't have to go to all these different systems to pull back the, the data you need or to, to enrich the data you need. You can essentially automate that, right? And that frees the team up to doing additional things, to doing additional contextual enrichment and, and, and things like that. Go for custom rule de development. If you have the free time, you can, if you free yourself up with automation, look into how you can take your, your security appliances and add custom rules to it. Things that can, can be helpful too is data stacking. Talk a little bit more about threat intelligence and, and threat hunting, but, but not too, too deep into it. But data stacking is something that we can do to help us manage threat intelligence to see whether or not if we're consuming threat intelligence, it's, it's good threat intelligence or not. And then whether or not we can operationalize it. And also it helps us in threat hunting because it helps us understand what are the, the frequencies of least occurrences kind of thing. Data stacking helps us do that. So technology. So when it comes to technology, what are, what are we doing? We're trying to identify those gaps. It's not just gaps in, in the tooling. You have analyst tooling. You have infrastructure tooling, right? You have sensors and coverage visibility stuff. So you're, you're, you're trying to look at it from all those different kinds of angles, right? Do the analysts have the tools that they need to have to combat what, what they're tasked to do, right? What can happen? Is the infrastructure in place, right? Are you monitoring at the right places? Are there, where are there, there are gaps there? And do they do these things that they're supposed to do? A security device that you have on your network, is, is, it, is it doing the right thing that it needs to do in order to be successful? Testing and tuning alerts, um, but you know, always trust but verify. Okay, don't just take the vendor's word for it. You got to verify. You got to push it because if it's a if you're using a security product, you're using any kind of technology that's out there, whether it's open source or or not, adversaries know that those things exist. Whether they're red teamers or or really um, nefarious bad guys, they know that all these other defensive tools exist, and they're trying to find their ways around them as well. So be proactive and and start working on st on that stuff before the adversary finds those gaps, right? You should be trying to find those gaps first. What would APT do? What does that look like on your network? Do you have the right endpoint visibility? Do you have the right you know, network visibility? I talked about that a little bit. What are some things that we can do? So if you have malware and you wanna, you wanna look at it, you wanna see what that malware does, I'm gonna get a little bit more into this, you know, synthesis uh, in a little bit. But essentially, if you have examples of what may look be bad or may not even just be you know, anything malicious. If you want to just test some of the this visibility gaps, um, especially on the networking side, there's a couple of different tools that are at our at disposal. One is GopherCap, which is essentially like a TCP replay, but written in Golang, I believe. And, it's in, and you have TCP replay. So if you have packets, if you have saved PCAP, and that PCAP is alerting on something, run those PCAPs through your, your security stack. See what happens. You know, there might be stuff that you need to do too from a, from a thresholding perspective, right? T test that out. And these are just some, some things that you need to be thinking about, right? Trying to find the, the gaps before the adversary does. And I talked a little bit about custom rule creation, but if you're doing that, if your SOC is that mature and you're doing custom rules and developing that, have some type of knowledge base for that stuff. Just one analyst in the corner writing all these custom rules is maybe great, but if that analyst is gone on vacation, whatever moves on, you got to understand what those custom rules mean or what they represent. Just, just like we do when we, we see a snort rule fire or an AV rule fire, we're trying to understand, you know, what's the context around it? You look at a snort rule that fires, and if it doesn't have that reference tag, and lots of times they do, especially when it's dealing with, with malware, there's, like a, there's a VT uh, uh, reference link. So you can go and actually go look at VT, a virus total, and say, okay, that malware is what that snort signature was for. 
and, and that's very helpful for us, right? As analysts, when we're seeing those snort or any kind of um, things fire, we need to add, you know, the the context uh, to it. And so, if you're doing the custom rules in house, same same kind of thing. You need to add the context to it. So so other analysts in the SOC can 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 operationalize around that alert as well. They can look at it and say, oh, okay, I know what Troy was thinking when he wrote this because here's here's the knowledge base article that he wrote on it. And here's some techniques that are used to either verify it's a true positive or, or, or kind of, you know, throw it in the false positive bucket. So, so those things, those things help, you know, obviously learning from past events and incidents, that's, that's key. It's fundamental to the, to the cyclical approach of an incident response. If you're not learning from that, then, you know, you're, you're doomed to repeat kind of thing. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's unfortunate if that's the case, if you're not learning, if you're not adapting, if you're not shifting based off of what did not work right. Uh, and, and share, you know, sharing is, is something that is, is, is vitally important in a SOC. If you're, whether it is just learning about some kind of new technique, you, you read a new article, um, just whatever it is, sharing and having that conversation with with other analysts in, in, in your organization or just in, in your community too. It doesn't have to be just in your, in your organization. If you're within your communities, that, that sharing these ideas creates this diversity of thought. There's no one way to tackle a problem and getting other people's opinions and other people's you know, input kind of helps build, uh, you know, crowdsource, if you will, our, our approach, because, you know, the adversary, we all heard this again, another cliche, you know, thing, but the adversary only needs to be right once. We need to be right 100% of the time. That is, this is how it is. So, you know, crowdsource, share, cr- you know, create that environment where, where it's promoted and, and not shunned. You know, get into the creating the rules and, 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 and managing rules as they're firing. We talk about tuning. So what, is this, what does this look like? Usually it's like you either got this, this mindset where we're going to turn everything on or you got the mindset of, you know, we got to, we got to manage this somehow, right? Let's be a little bit more tactical about what we're actually responding to, right? Collecting all the things may, it may be a good idea. And from a threat hunting perspective and data stacking perspective, if you can operate, operationalize around all that data, great, right? But most cases, getting all that is, is not the ideal thing, right? Alerting on everything is not the right thing. You're not going to be able to keep up with all the events of interest or all the incidents that, that, that are coming through. Right. When we talk about threat intelligence feeds, you know, you know, I put intelligence in quotes. I am an advocate for threat intelligence. I, I've, I think it's, it's helped me out over the years as an analyst, as a threat analyst. But just subscribing to a feed is not intelligence. Not, it's not intelligence, right? Threat intelligence is essentially data with context. So if you're just getting IPs and domains and you're throwing them in said security device to stop bad stuff, um, you're probably going to either break stuff or you're going to just, if it's a passive mode, you're going to alert to so many things that you're not going to be able to, um, um, uh, to, to, to wrap your head around. So, so really make sure that you're, you're, you're careful with that. So if you're data stacking in your environment and you know you have all these observables and you can take these threat intelligence feeds and kind of run them through like, a, hey, you know, how often have we seen a lot of this stuff? before you then implement it in a, a proactive or, or passive mode, then that's, that's, re- that's really be- more beneficial than just throwing that all in there. I've seen really bad, even good threat intelligence feeds where sometimes stuff like 8.8.8 or, or just like the hash equivalent of, of, of hex 2.0 gets put in there be- because you know, that sometimes that those, th- those threat intelligence feeds are, are automated based off of whatever uh, put that together. We talked a little bit about the uh, making sure that the things that you're investing time and money in are actually doing things that they're doing. We talked about customization, whether it's Yara or Snore, Suricata, Zeek, those things help us customize and really fill those technological gaps that I talked about earlier that maybe said security appliance doesn't do. Are those things working or are they surviving over, over updates and code releases and stuff like that? I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned in the past with dealing with some of these open source technologies, but it doesn't have to be open source too. Whatever you're doing, you want to make sure that how good is it moving forward, right? Uh, how um, does it break when you do an update? Does it not work anymore for some, for some reason, right? You're, you're constantly maintaining that infrastructure 
proactively. So I want to talk about the one examples I have with, with Bro. And I'm going to talk about Bro. I know it's called Zeke now, but at the time when this was going on, I was doing this research, it was Bro. So I have this love-hate relationship with Bro. I, I've, I've been using Bro since in experimenting, researching it since about 2013-ish. And it's just a fantastic tool. And I, and I love everything it does. And then I run up some scenarios where I'm like, really, guys? And I, and I want to share some of those things because these are the lessons learned that I had over time and, you know, kind of the, the, the fill you in. So about 2014, I think it was like fall of 2014, Shellshock, which was a big vulnerability in Bash that existed the whole time since like, I don't know, 1982, sometime in their, the, the 80s, like since Bash was Bash, this vulnerability existed and it was discovered or at least, you know, publicly made aware in 2014. So then all of a sudden, one day as a security analyst, you come in and you just start seeing in your like HTTP logs and some other, all these other logs, you start seeing these like bash commands, right? And you're like, what's going on? I wanted to test out some things and I was doing different, some different research with, uh, against different protocols. And I was picking on, you know, um, um, you know, mail protocols, you know, email, MTA, mail trust for 30 stuff. And I was, I was running this stuff through an MTA, trying to test it. And every and I was getting the, the the bro log and the mail from data was blank, and I'm like, why is it doing this? Like this is the 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 syntax up here. This mail from bash, you know, this this. I mean, it might not work. I might have like you know, fudged something up, but it still should be like recorded in this field, and it's not. Bro was recording it in like HTTP fields, like in the refer fields and some other things, but it wasn't re- recording it here. And so I dug into the um to the the actual uh, bro script that that is responsible for this. And there was a regular expression for the RFC 1918 compliance for the mail from string or value. And, and although RFC 1918 is great for, you know, all the thing, all the people and, and, and things that want to behave according to how they're supposed to behave, we know attackers don't unfortunately follow all the RFCs. Unfortunately, if, if, if they did, then we can just e- easily put in like the signatures for the, uh, for the evil bit and stop all the things, right? But they don't. So I, I saw that and I, and I reached out to the, so the bro developers and they were like, yeah, well, that's what RFC says. So that's just how it is. So I don't know if it still exists like that, but, um, but I just kind of was like, oh, like I thought like something was breaking. I got PCAPs and I was like, no, this, de- this data is going. It was just bro that was doing a regular expression for RFC 1918 compliant string and and if it didn't match and it would just be blank. So you know that was one example. The other example kind of irked me a lot more. And that is this this concept of if you if you've anybody that wrote, wrote custom bro scripts or Zeek scripts, the, I, I had one that well, I was testing out and doing some research with and it was basically decoding an NTLM communication to to a web proxy. And out of the blue, so I had this working and it was all logging. And it was great. It would pull out the username, host name, and domain of the NTLM authenticated user, authenticated to the proxy, and would act, add that to the bro log. Then one day I come into work and there's poop in the logs. And, and we're like, what's going on, right? This is, this is my code, by the way. I, I had a else statement that probably should not have been as operational as it was. Um, but basically, if it failed to um, decode, it wrote you know, poop in that value. But what happened was, bro changed in a minor release, mind you. They were at 2.3 something to another 2.3 something. They changed the array indexing from zero to one, meaning the first value of the array went from being indexed at zero to being indexed at one. And that threw everything off to the right. But then they went back to zero. So I was just like, guys, what are you, what are you doing? You're killing me. From a programming perspective, you don't do things like that, right? But, you know, in, in all, you know, the name of academia, it is what it is or was what it was. Uh, another example was, uh, you know, testing out uh, a security appliance and making sure that, that this appliance was supposed to pull data off a wire and, and detect evilness. And we had it working just fine. When we used a, it was a PDF that designed with some stuff in it to alert. It worked fine over HTTP, uh, but when we replayed the traffic over FTP, it went right through. So that's one of the things where we're like, okay, that, that's not cool. I mean, both protocols are clear text. Why isn't it, even though the vendor said that it was supposed to be able to pull data off of FTP, 
it didn't alert me. And it kind of brings me to the kill chain. And I know this is not as cool as it used to be, or at least, you know, it's not the buzzword anymore. But I wanted to bring it there because as SOC analysts, when you're looking at the kill chain, you're, you're always trying to go back to identification. You want to know where in the kill chain your alerts are firing, right? Where in that, where, where do you need to be to, to kind of like put your head like priorities wise? Are you catching it in delivery or are you catching it in command and control? Those are two different scenarios that you want to make sure that those are not always equal, right? And if you are just catching in delivery, take advantage of that and synthesize that attack as much as possible. And that brings us to adversarial simulation, right? Companies are usually tested twice, once during a pen test, the other during attack. Don't wait for the attack. Pen tests are great, but don't wait to go get a third party to do the pen test, right? Make sure that you're, you're routinely going through them and make them personal to your, to your network and use minor attack framework. It's, it's helpful. It's helpful to, 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 to map the attacker, but it's also helpful to, to map your coverage and where, where your capabilities lie. Really have some more than one dance move, right? Dance moves, the more dance moves you have, the better you are prepared. Tools will fail you, be prepared, right? For example, if you're dealing with massive PCAPs, try opening up a one plus gig PCAP with Wireshark. It's not fun, especially if you put a filter on it and remove filter. It, it, it's, it's really not fun and it breaks down, right? Use other tools like T-Shark, TCP dump, Zeke, Custom Base 64, Rolling XOR. You know, use some other approaches to solve those problems. So one of the last mentions that I want to talk about is don't forget about the tools that you have that you may not be using, right? NetFlow example is an example. NetFlow has been around for years. Probably if you're in an enterprise environment and you have layer three switches and routers, you probably already have NetFlow capability. Are you using it? NetFlow scales very well. It scales across your environment very well because it's at those layer three switches and routers. You know, sometimes we talk about those egress and egress points and where those choke points are. And that's where we want to put all of our security devices. But then we're missing all the different lateral type stuff and activities. NetFlow can help us there. But there's, there's probably a lot of things that our tools can help us with. And we just want to make sure that we're managing those tools to the best of the maturity that they are instead of having to just go buy the next shiny, great thing. Keep your sock engaged. A engaged sock is a happy sock. Do the things like we were talking about, CTFs, challenge each other, come up with internal challenges and challenge each other. Have rotational deep dives, like take an analyst and say, okay, for a week, you're just going to deep dive something and, 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 and work on that. We'll take care of the rest of the stuff there. Have that analyst come back and, and, learn, and, and, and teach to the SOC what they've, what they've learned, and you're probably all going to learn from that. And don't forget to come up for air, breathe, relax, have fun, be collaborative, share ideas, all these things right, to help us you know, make sure that, that SOC is, is a well-oiled machine. And with that, I think that's my last slide. That was great. Sorry about that. I had to speed it up towards the towards the latter end of it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all do that, right? The first yeah. uh, the the first half of a talk is usually the first quarter of the slides. Isn't that the way it works? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that uh, you were you're were touching on at the end of that was uh, information sharing, doing the lessons learned. All right, here's what happened. Here's what we pulled out. Do you have any good tips on that? Because that was always something I struggled with is having like a, a consistent way to capture good learnings. Yeah, I think that the knowledge base, um, having some kind of, you know, shared knowledge base and what, whether it be like an internal wiki or some something else in house, like kind of related to the custom development things where you can go back and learn from, okay, this is, this is what said thing means or like a custom, you know, rule means kind of similar to that, to where, if you have an incident management ticketing system, that might help. Or if you can use the concept of tagging. So like, say if it's related to a, a alert looking for lateral movement, you can tag it as like lateral movement. Kind of, kind of use the kill chain. That, and, I, and then, like I said, I still like the kill chain from a methodology perspective to say, where is the attacker in that kill chain? Where are the alerts that are firing that we're detecting it in that kill chain? Because it helps us prioritize. But you can also use that as a methodology from a defender to tag it, right? To say, hey, this event happened, and here's these rules that fired, and we can tag those as they were data exfiltration rules, right? And this is why they're a false positive, or maybe not. Yeah, I like that. I did like, you know, the the whether it's a, a kill chain or an attack path or whatever it is that uh, an org chooses, the, the very fact of having a lifecycle that attack 
to your point, makes it so much easier to figure out what goes where and when and why, and to to start racing, right? How how can we shorten our ability to detect and prevent and respond to these? Yeah, absolutely. I did have one more question on Slack. It's probably a troll question, but it's a good question for you. Is there any okay. such thing as a happy sock? I, I think so. I, I've been there. So I don't know if it's a, if it, it could be or not. I didn't mean it that way. Uh, I meant it to be from, from an engagement perspective. There have been times where it, you know, being in the, if you've been in the soccer or somebody else has been in the sock where there's not a lot of talking or joking around, it, that could be either one of two things. You could have a, a problem with engagement where nobody really wants to work with each other and you have those. And, 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 and sometimes you're a family, so that happens, right? There are ups and downs. Or you oh, yeah. could be in the middle of an incident, right? And if you're in the middle of an incident, then everybody's quiet. That, that could be that everybody's on the keyboard doing things. But yeah, absolutely. I think it's important to have fun because there's a lot of pressure on sock, the sock analyst, especially if you like, if you turn around one day and you're like, you're the only one in the sock for whatever reason. And you're like, you don't want to be that one person, right? Like, please, nothing fire today. Please, nothing happen. I want to just go home, right? Because I'm all by myself, especially in the days of COVID, right? That might be, you know, something, you, you, you know, it's important to, to, to let loose, to have like, um, you know, stuff like movie trivia or just, just things to loosen up because it can be a very stressful job and having that uh, can help uh, relieve the pressure. Yeah, it certainly can be stressful, but I like the, the tips you provided because you're right. I mean, if and this is something I argue about quite a lot on Twitter for for whatever reason. But if you're if you're in security, you know you should really enjoy what you're doing, right? You should be able to find the fun, even if it is perhaps sometimes masochistic fun. You should be able to find the fun and the bright spots because otherwise, why why are we here? Why right? we we would go be dentists or something? I don't know. Absolutely, no, absolutely, you hit the nail on the head. 